says it may be happening in about three weeks okay. on election day. Well, Ron Paul, there he is. You'll have He's to go the to the best. internet to uh, watch Ron Paul there. But um, behind me, you'll see a, a story that, well, let me backstep a little bit. There are so many 9-11 groups starting up now. People are always saying, well, how come we don't see professionals speaking out? And, of course, we have the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, and we have firefighters for 9-11 Truth. We now have uh, legal professionals or lawyers for 9-11 Truth. We have medical professionals for 9-11 Truth. We have pilots for 9-11 Truth. We have politicians for 9-11 Truth. We have security uh, professionals for 9-11 Truth. Um, and, of course, the librarians who have been instrumental in fighting for truth and justice against this Patriot Act bullshit, all, pardon the French, all along the way. And what this article behind me is telling you is uh, that there's something that is extraordinarily powerful, and the medical field uses it. Um, it's called evidence-based medicine. It's a, it's a system whereby all the information that's known about a certain subject is gathered into one place and categorized according to the effectiveness or the uh, reliability of the evidence and you're able to add your own information to it as you need you know as you discover more and so a doctor out in the boondocks was able to get online if you can get online he what he had no excuse to say I didn't know anything about the latest treatments well the suggestion is that we model our 9-11 group after this evidence-based medicine. Look that up, EBM, it's initial, evidence-based medicine. Um, the internet and the system of people all doing this research is like distributed processing. It's so powerful, it's so powerful, and that's why we're growing exponentially. The truth is coming out. You politicians better take note. It's time for you to start gradually shifting back. Well, I was always for 9-11 truth. You know I was. You know I had to talk like that because the other guys would have, you know, kicked me out or they wouldn't have voted for anything I wanted. So, you know, you know, I was with you guys all the time. I knew they were lying. Yeah. Well, now the lies are coming out every time you turn around. Um, and David Ray Griffin is probably the leader in the movement is, you know, giving the movement respectability. He's done nine, nine eleven books, nine of them, and I've got six of them. The cognitive infiltration here is the latest one. I guess I should pick that up and kind of hold it up. Cognitive infiltration. That's the one where he critiques the Cass Sunstein uh, treatise on. 9-11 groups being dangerous and it's it's wonderful in fact he he not only digs into the exoteric uh meaning of the article but he he surmises or or at least points out a possible way to look at the esoteric meaning showing that this guy is while he's condemning the 9-11 groups he's putting out enough information to completely contradict everything it's in the exoteric explanation so it gives you a good way of looking at things. Like when you read something and you, and you see little footnotes, go look up the footnote. I mean, go look up what that footnote refers to. Read it and see if it says what the author is implying that it says. Does it actually support the you know, contention that's in the author's writing? Or does it support the opposite? So th this is interesting. I'm not through with that book yet. Um, put up CG number five. That goes along with that. But David Ray Griffin just narrowly missed dying recently. I don't think it's any conspiracy theory or anything like that. He's had a bad back, and it's complicated with a bad heart. And he recently had an operation that put in a pig valve. And uh, then his pig valve got uh, infected. Put up CG1... or. Yeah, let's see, CG number eight now. That last CG was about the uh, think tank calling for, you know, cognitive infiltration of 9-11 groups. That's what we're talking about with this book. But this one that we just put up here is David Ray Griffin's own writing telling everybody what happened 
uh, about his health, and you can read it yourself there, or you can go to davidraygriffin.com. I think it's .com. It might be a .org, but I'm, I think it's .com. And the letter is posted there, too, so you can read all about his uh, ailments and how he got that way. But, uh, well, I guess the thing about David Ray Griffin is that he, he really covers the subject well, and he doesn't waste time with a lot of fancy words. Every, every word he says is calculated to carry the meaning that it needs to carry. He doesn't have to say very much for you to get the full picture, and he's great at it. Now, in this clip that we're about to see, it's about a seven-minute clip, he starts, this, this is actually a 2009, um, uh, the, we're going to be playing clip number five, the, the okay. second to the last one, I think. Anyway, um, he talks about the Deutsche Bank, the one that, you know, found all the fragments of human remains on its roof, and it's, what, 600 feet away from the towers? And, uh, the insurance company wouldn't pay off to Deutsches Bank. They were saying that that isn't debris from the towers. That's just ordinary dust. And um, anyway, David Ray Griffin goes through that, and he explains how several other organizations analyzed that dust that didn't have anything to do with the 9-11 movement. So people always tell you, oh, that's just truth or science. You know, you adjust it the way you want it. Well, this is science from other groups that uh, don't do that type of twisting. And we'll let David Ray Griffin go on. Now, this is, like I was saying, a 2009 thing. Uh, it was his treatise on uh, whether or not we should be in Afghanistan. It's great. There's seven parts on the Internet, and this is virtually two-thirds of part six. So let her rip. This is David Ray Griffin talking about the bank. The nearby Deutsche Bank building was heavily com contaminated by dust produced when the World Trade Center was destroyed. But the bank's insurance company refused to pay off, saying, oh, well, that's just ordinary building dust, not from the World Trade Center event. So the Deutsche Bank hired a well-known research organization known as the R.J. Lee Group. And it showed that the dust in the building definitely was uh, from the World Trade Center because it had a unique chemical signature. Part of the signature was spherical iron particles. And this meant, R.J. Lee Group said, that iron had melted during the World Trade Center event, producing spherical metallic particles. Now, that's significant because the fires could not have possibly, under the most ideal circumstances, gotten over 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and uh, iron does not melt until 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're at least 1,000 degrees short. Also, the R.J. Lee study found that temperatures had been reached at which lead would have undergone vaporization meaning over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And another study was carried out by scientists at the U.S. Geological Survey. This is a government agency. Besides also finding iron particles, these scientists found that molybdenum had been melted. And this is uh, astounding because it is notorious for its extremely high melting point almost 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So when anybody ridicules the science produced by the 9-11 uh, truth scientists like Stephen Jones and so on and just says, oh, well, that's just truth or science, you cite these studies by the U.S. Geological Survey and the R.J. Lee Group, which have nothing to do with our movement. These two studies prove, therefore, that something had produced temperatures many times higher, higher than the fires could have produced. NIST, however, made no mention of these studies. But even this was not the end of its omission of physical evidence. A report by several scientists, including University of Copenhagen chemist Niels Herrett, showed that the World Trade Center dust contained unreacted nanothermite. 
Now, ordinary thermite has been around for quite a while and it's an incendiary. But nanothermite is a rather recent invention and it is a high explosive, a very powerful explosive. This report by Herod and his colleagues did not appear until 2009, several months after the publication of NIST's final report, so it could not have included it. But NIST should have as a matter of uh, routine uh, following the standard procedures. Besides omitting and distorting evidence to deny the demolition theory of Building 7's collapse, NIST also fabricated evidence, simply made it up to support its own theory. NIST's explanation as to how fires caused Building 7 to collapse starts with thermal expansion, meaning that the fire heated up the steel, causing it to expand. An expanding steel beam on the 13th floor, NIST claims, caused a steel girder attached to a column to break loose, one of those 82 steel columns supporting the building. So this girder broke loose. Having lost its support, this column failed, and this started a chain reaction in which all other 87, 81 columns also failed. Now, ignoring the question of whether this is even remotely plausible, let us simply ask, why did that girder fail? Because, NIST claimed, it was not connected to the floor slab with shear studs. Shear studs are these great big things, <laughs> uh, whole things to the, connected to the floor slab. NIST wrote, in World Trade Center 7, no studs were installed on the girders. Another passage. Floor beams had shear studs, but the girders that supported the floor, uh, floor beams did not have shear studs. But if you look back at a report that was put out by NIST in 2004, before it had developed this theory, this was called Interim Report on World Trade Center 7. Here's what you read. The girders, as well as the beams, were attached to the floors by means of shear studs. In the 2008 document, NIST just repeated almost word for word that same paragraph, but omitted the word and girders. Another case of fabrication is a graphic in NIST report. Um, see, everything NIST did was, was based on computer simulations. They had no actual data, you know, the building was long gone. And uh, they had a few photographs, and they had a few testimonies. They ignored <laughs> most of those. And uh, so they just, had, they just made stuff up. They just created parameters and data, and they fed them into the machine, the computer, until the computer would produce collapse. And uh, so they, they put graphics in there so you could see, uh, this would tell you the progress of the fire on a given floor. And so they would show you a graphic and you could see big, big flames. It's almost like, you know, a cartoon, uh, uh, cartoon book. And so anyway, a graphic in the report shows a huge fire at 5 o'clock on the 12th floor. Uh, this claim is essential to NIST's explanation as to why the building collapsed uh, 20 months, 21 minutes later at 521. But if you look back at that same 2004 report, here's what you will find. Around 4.45 p.m., a photograph showed fires on floors 7, 8, 9, and 11 near the middle of the north face. Floor 12 was burned out by this time. So 4.45, they said, the fire's completely burned out. Now in 2008, they tell us, at 5 o'clock, there's this raging fire going on on floor 12.